Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Embry. I'm the chair of the Future Forum uh, board this year, and I want to thank you very much for uh, coming, coming to this event today, um, our conversation on the 2020 census and implications for Texas. As a bit of background, the Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, and national topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our great members and sponsors, including the Downtown Austin Alliance, the Jeff Eller Group, Austin Wine Merchant, and Joe Cook's Catering. Thank you very much to our sponsors. If you're not a member, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave today, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end of the program. Uh, members enjoy the best of what the Future Forum has to offer, including first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and benefits at the LBJ Presidential Library, where we are here today. Our next event is on February 24th, and it will be a discussion of the Texas primary, which will be uh, just a couple weeks later, and also uh, what's going on in the national election at that point. And our panel will include Jonathan Martin of the New York Times, Dr. Vicki Soto of the LBJ School, and Jim Henson of the Texas Politics Project. This will be moderated by Cassie Pollock of the Texas Tribune, and this is a uh, joint uh, event that we're having with the Tribune, and it'll be over in their event space on February 24th. Other spring events will include uh, events on climate change and women in leadership. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll turn it over to our panel, um, and our moderator will introduce the panel. Please keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end. Um, and now I will turn it over to Alexa Ura, demographics reporter and associate editor of the Texas Tribune, to introduce our guests and moderate our discussion. Hi, everyone. Uh, we've got about 40 to 45 minutes that we'll do up here, then we'll go to questions, so hold on to those. Uh, I'm going to start introducing our panelists from the far end here. Uh, we have Justin Yancey. He is the president of the Texas Business Leadership Council. Before joining the council in 2001, he served in the administrations of Governor, Governors George W. Bush and Rick Perry. Next to him is John Lawler, who is the census program manager for Travis County. He worked in local campaign organizing before that and in city council. Next to him is Genesis Sanchez. She's a regional census manager for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, otherwise known as NALEO. Before that, she worked in community organizing with Vote, Run, Lead, and Jolt. And last but not least, we have Lila Valencia. She is a senior demographer at the Texas Demographic Center, which has been incredibly active in various spaces working toward an accurate count. She has more than 10 years of experience doing data work and research in both the public and private sector. Thanks for being here. So uh, we are sitting here um, with the 2020 census officially kicking off this week in Alaska, of all places, where the iced over Bering Sea allowed for Census Bureau workers to start the count in some remote fishing village. Luckily, we don't need iced overseas to reach people here. Uh, the work here won't start until mid-March when we'll have questionnaires go out to millions and millions of Texans determining everything from our political representation to the money the state gets for early childhood programs and all of that. Uh, but it's pretty likely that the count is actually going to miss quite a few people in our state. And so I wanted to start by asking each of you about what your elevator pitch has become in the lead up to the census count. You know, what are the stakes that you're emphasizing to the different groups or communities that you're each focusing on? Who wants to start? I guess I, I can start. Um, whenever I'm giving presentations, it really, I really, I try to cater you know, the information to the different groups that we're uh, presenting to, if it's business groups or um, you know, transportation groups. And really, the, the decennial census touches all of those groups. And so I really start with just the billions of dollars that are at stake for all states. And in particular, for the state of Texas, we really have, I mean, we received over like 61 billion dollars um, in the last fiscal year on uh, funds that are coming from the federal government from census-derived data. And so I let them know it's about real specific things that touch our everyday lives, like schools, healthcare, parks, transportation. So that's sort of been my elevator pitch lately. Yeah. Genesis, you're training a lot of folks. How are you, what is the sort of elevator pitch you're making to them about why this matters and why they should get involved? Yeah, I think it's pretty similar to Lila in that um, you have to make the pitch kind of specific to the group. 
Uh, one of the things that I have emphasized though is as a Latino organization, our marching orders are to get Latinos counted. But one of the things that we've seen because of like the lack of resources and funding and infrastructure in the state um, is that I have to involve all sorts of groups. And so I have to make the pitch pretty um, large, right? I have to remind everybody that um, like Lila said, it involves all of us, it impacts all of us. And I do think that there, um, I'm sure Lila can relate, but making the pitch to different political leanings as well, because um, we're nonpartisan, but, and the census has become a really contentious issue because of things like the citizenship question. I think like going back to the actual reality, like here are real funds, um, these are real things that you touch every day. And uh, my strategy from the beginning was to work with moms and kids because they're really like leaders in the community and then it's branched out from there. Well, so like Genesis and Lila have already mentioned, it really depends upon who you're talking to. I usually divide it either between, you know, folks who already know why the census is important or they don't. Um, if folks aren't aware of how, you know, many different facets of life that data impacts, I try to kind of walk them through that. I use a similar example of from the moment you wake up and you step out your door, you know, the car that you're jumping in, those roads you're driving on, census data is, you know, information that TxDOT uses to fund improvements around the state. When you're passing by either a grocery store or not, that's demographic data based on the census that HEB uses on whether or not they'll put a new grocery store there. And that job that you eventually go to is either there because, you know, of the strong data on the ground that, you know, had that job pop up or wasn't there. So throughout the whole day, someone can figure out the census impacts it. Um, now, if someone already knows why it's important, usually the pitch is more about how we're going to do something about it. Um, because a lot of times, you know, there's already been some folks who have already been laying some great ground game around our different institutional camps here in Central Texas, at least. Um, folks are now really eager and hungry to know, well, what are we going to do about it? I echo everything that's been said here. I think the only thing I, that I might add that, we, that I include in my message is that on top of all of that, which is the most important, it's the first time ever we're primarily doing this online. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, a, it's just you can't stress enough how many, how many times you need to tell people and, and tell organizations and tell businesses and tell churches and uh, you know, all, all the groups that, uh, that are working on, on, uh, make sure, on outreach that uh, this is a little different than they may remember from the past and that, that certainly there are opportunities to fill out a form of paper. But, the online aspect is going to be big, and I hope it's going to, we all hope it's going to go very well. Oh. So those working toward an accurate count in Texas are in many ways starting from behind just because we are home to millions of people who fall into these categories of people that are considered hard to count. Um, you know, a common refrain I hear among folks working on this very locally is that the people who most depend on the funding that, this, that is based on the census are at the highest risk of being missed. But Lila, I'm curious, like, who exactly are we talking about when we talk about these hard to count communities? Because how do you sort of normalize that in a state like ours that's so diverse in both people and geography? Sure, well in Texas, um, we have nearly 25 million people or about, um, I'm sorry, nearly 25% or 7 million people in the state of Texas that are living in neighborhoods that are considered hard to count. And now these um, definitions of what is hard to count, is, it goes back to census data, um, census research that has been look, looking at past censuses and past surveys and really looking to see who's not responding, who's not turning in their mail uh, forms and those things of that nature. And what we find is that you know, a, a lot of the communities are communities that represent the face of Texas. So they are immigrants, um, they are people of color, they are people who live below the poverty line, they are people who live in homes of mixed statuses, and they're children. There's a lot of, um, you know, this is one of the groups that's really interesting, in particular young children, children under five, have been increasing in their undercount. So in 2000, they were undercounted, and then in 2010, the percentage by which they were undercounted increased. And so we're really concerned that in 2020, that could go up even further. So that really, um, something that uh, Genesis mentioned really um, struck a chord because talking about children and families is really important, specifically for the young um, children undercount because young families tend to have these young children. These young children and young families tend to be uh, families of color, and they also tend to have lower poverty or uh, increased poverty and lower incomes. 
And so when we talked about the child undercount, it's really important because it covers many of these hard to count populations. Yeah. John, how do you go about prioritizing this? Where do you even start your ground game? You know, obviously Austin is less diverse than some of our other big urban centers, but you, you've still got sort of a range of populations you're working with. Sure, absolutely, and that's um, still taking ideas on how to do that exactly. <laughs> Grab me afterwards. Um, but no, so something really cool that we've been able to do here in Travis County is you know, looking at these national tools like the Census Bureau put together, which is definitely from a national lens trying to get to the local level. We're looking at all the research that Lila and her team has done at the statewide level, which is from a statewide lens. We've tried to kind of create our own local lens, and we've, we've pulled from each of those different tools that were already available. And uh, you know, because when you look at it from a national lens or even a statewide lens, Travis County is not that, not that hard to count. Nowhere near comparable, I'm sure, other parts of the state you're in, like the Valley, parts of Houston where they're experiencing natural disasters, or Dallas, you know, everyone's experiencing gentrification and displacement to some degree. Um, and so Travis County, if you put them up, you know, and compare them to other parts of the state, not as bad. But thankfully, I get to be selfish and only focus on Travis County and Austin. And so through that lens, if you start looking at some of our local variables that make folks hard to count, which because of the great impact of displacement and places, you know, communities of color, uh, you know, whether or not someone is a recent you know, transplant into another part of the county is a big variable in whether or not they're going to be hard to count. Um, traditionally, the Census Bureau has relied on, relied upon a lot of institutional strategies to get out the count. But again, unfortunately, because of things like displacement and other things occurring right now in our urban communities and urban counties, we can't rely as much upon those because that church that used to be right down the road that a multi-generational family, you know, used to attend, they may now be in Pflugerville, right? Or for example, you might have someone moving in, right? We've got folks from all over Williamson County and Hayes County moving into Travis County in the Central Texas region. So given that, uh, we've been really trying hard to kind of come at a data perspective. Uh, you know, Dr. Valencia has been huge helping us out with that. And we've kind of come up with our own set, our own index to say, okay, based on all these things happening in our locality, what then are the neighborhoods that are hard to count? And it's very similar to what the Census Bureau and the state has provided but it just kind of gives us a better understanding of what's going on in that neighborhood. Is it because they're foreign born? Is it because they have a limited English proficiency? And what has resulted in is a cool little tool we're gonna to be using and some methodology so that when we start to try to get out our ground game, uh, we're, we're aware of what's going on. Yeah, Dennis, you're training up local officials and organizers often in communities that don't have as many resources as Travis County might or don't even have a census program manager. Yeah. How do, what does the prioritizing look like in those communities where you're, just, you're, you're starting from a very different place? Yeah, so I think it's been, that has been the challenge, right? Like trying to mobilize people um, in such a quick amount of time because when we look back in the past year, I'm, I'm sure that John, you jumped on board after I did, right? And so we jumped on board right as yeah, a Yeah, you're the veteran. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not that long. I've been, I've been in the census world since June, and so that's like at the height of the citizenship question. When we saw that Texas really was not gonna invest any money, then we had to kind of go back and, and figure out, okay, how do we localize this? How do, and for me, that has been bringing a national campaign. So we have our, uh, Naleo has a national campaign that's called Agase Contar which in Spanish is make yourself count. And so we had to figure out ways to localize it. Like what does it look like? What materials do people need? What kind of support do they need? Um, and so we have tried to emphasize like we, our strategy is kind of help being coach people and organizations, partners really like leveraging the, the like masses and saying like, here's a simple way of conducting a campaign. Here are all the resources you need. Take it and localize it, make it your own. Um, but also emphasizing that, as a, if you think of it as a campaign, I was I used to work in the voter registration arena, and so you think about like what do you need to get someone to take an action? You need a lot of touches. What do those touches look like? Um, and so just sharing basic, I think, organizing principles has been really helpful in kind of making it more relatable to those communities. So what does it mean? Does it mean like, um, like for example, in the valley, one of the great examples that I heard was that people. Um, the counties were involving like paleteros, like ice cream men. Because every kid goes to a paletero, right? You see them, so if they have a census message on their like little ice cream truck or van, then it's really easy, you know, the kid sees it over and over and over again leading up to the census, they're gonna ask their parent about it, and then their parent will take action. And so um, you just kinda have to find those like little avenues, creative 
not very costly <laughs> avenues because that's the other, I think, ch challenge that we've all faced in the work. Yeah. Justin, on the business level beyond the paleteros that are <laughs> walking up and down the streets, is your priority giving the business owner sort of the messaging to encourage their employees to participate? Is it putting iPads and computers in every break room so that people fill out the questionnaire while they're in there having their lunch? What is, what is the priority on the business side? Yeah, thanks. I mean, it can be all of the above, but to, if I can sort of put that in a setting, when, when uh, Texas Counts was created by the Center for Public Policy Priorities and the Communities <laughs> Foundation of Texas, uh, they created different subcommittees, and I was asked to, to co-chair the business subcommittee and so from, from our perspective, there are multiple things that can be done. I mean, our messaging is certainly, uh, I would just say, easier than some of, some of the other, our counterparts that have, uh, as we're just, you know, hard to reach areas, hard to count areas. Um, but our employers, we're sending messages that they will send to employees, uh, asking that they, explaining how important this is, asking that they please not, do not uh, uh, ignore the, the, the letter you receive mid-March and then the, the, the second letter, the, the reminder postcard and all that kind of, kind of thing that's going out, please don't ignore those. You need to, you need to, to do this. Um, but certainly there can be you know, break room. You can set up things to do it, it depending on the size of the company. Some are going to have more resources than others. But we've seen, we're hearing, hearing plans of, of even having you know, a, a company next door, a coffee company come in and so they can create a census day kickoff. Uh, you know, that would be really helpful. That's not going to happen every company, but if there can be a, a kiosk or a booth set up in companies, uh, just try to, and also uh, ask uh, employers to t ask their employees uh, to spread the word to their family, ex explain that it is, if you have a, an infant at home, that the infant needs to be counted as well, uh, and that we can just you know, go, go far and wide. And so within that, that's one, one sector, you're seeing the same things done and uh, work with, with you know, at least a couple of you up there on, on the, the Texas Counts. So just quickly before I forget, uh, texascounts.org uh, is the website and there's lots of resources on there, not just for business, for, for multiple organizations. So let's talk about what's not happening. Um, for all that's at stake with the census, Texas lawmakers last year ended the last legislative session before the count without putting any money directly toward this effort. Uh, meanwhile, California, for example, was putting 187 million toward getting an accurate count. What was the actual impact of that lack of state funding on the work that y'all are doing? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the, so historically the governor appoints the Secretary of State as sort of the census uh, administrator or coordinator for the state of Texas. And so this year, there was sort of some kind of turnover in, in that office, right? And so that itself kind of put us a little bit behind in getting started. But since um, her appointment, Secretary Hughes has um, convened state agencies to come together to sort of have a discussion around, you know, what can we do? The, the complete count for Texas is important. So what is it that we can do given that there is no funding? And um, state agencies are open to a lot of those ideas, but absolutely, you know, one of the questions was, you know, so let's say that we have to print out, you know, about 500 coloring books or more than, you know, a thousands, you know, thousands of coloring books for the schools around the state. You know, who's, who's paying for that printing? Who's, um, you know, doing the design for a lot of this? And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we don't have, you know, the answer to that question. And so state agencies are being asked to do as much as they can and sort of shuffle things around so that they can help where they, where they can help. But there are a lot of things that they can do. So for instance, um, we know that the, um, the Texas Department of Motor Vehicles has been talking about perhaps, you know, in, um, you know, their, their programming uh, prints out uh, your vehicle registration renewal form and you get that in the mail. Perhaps in that coding, they can add a message about the, cen the decennial census and, and how important it is to take that. And so there's lots of different little touch points that state agencies have that they may be able to use that have minimal cost. But for sure, were there some funding from the state, you know, some of these efforts might already be underway. Yeah. How are you all seeing this play out in what you're working on? I mean, I'll, I'll just say it, it was it was an abandonment of a responsibility by the state government to have stepped in. Um, they really should have been here at the table, right, funding direct outreach efforts. Um, but unfortunately, they did not for whatever reason. 
Um, I know there's folks here in this room actually who advocated at the state capitol last year so that there could have been funding from the state to local, you know, local campaigns, not just like our own, but in those other parts of the state that are even more hard to count. Um, you know, for example, uh, on our case, right, I'm a local campaign, so I'm Travis County, City of Austin, 50-50 split. You know, with this increasing environment, or this environment where it's increasingly becoming the responsibility for local governments to step up in certain places, you know, there's limited dollars for a city of Austin and the county of Travis, but they were, thankfully, due to the leadership of our county judge, Sarah Eckhart, and our mayor here in Austin, and a lot of the other leaders within the county of the different municipalities and school districts, they said this is worthwhile. So they invested $200,000 each. They invested for this role I have the privilege of serving in. But when I look at states like California, Michigan, New York, when I get on these conference calls with folks around the country who are talking about the resources that they have at their disposal, that they were getting started you know, years in advance in some cases, I just go, man, what a missed opportunity we had to really kind of finally put down, you know, put down in the record what exactly Texas looks like, you know, what it could have done for us here in Travis County and city, in the city of Austin when it comes to trying to figure out exactly where we are as a city and a community in terms of this historic population growth and movement of our historic neighborhoods. Um, you know, fortunately, you can, and you can see the results of this kind of work even in Texas, where communities like Houston and Harris County, they started out even earlier. They've got an amazing group called Houston in Action that started doing really on the ground, hard community organizing work uh, through a partnership with the Houston Endowment. And you may be more familiar with their work than I am through your, your statewide lens. Um, but they're already seeing the benefits of that. Now, they would probably say they needed more money and more time as well, but that would have been a really amazing opportunity had the state stepped up and provided additional funding for our region. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would echo both of those statements too, and I, it's a missed opportunity. It feels really disappointing because working on, the state, on a statewide basis, like right now we, so March 12th is when the, mail, the mailings go out for most of us, for about 90% of the population in the United States. Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about planning, you want people kind of mobilizing, like, at that period, we should be going into rapid response. We should be fielding, like, things that are happening more locally, but as it, as it stands right now, like, I'm still training people on what the census is. So part of it is that people are really behind. A lot of people were waiting on funding to come through. We relied very heavily on private foundations to do that legwork. Um, and so people just didn't have the staff, the capacity, the time really to, to invest into census. And if you're not seeing it from the top down, then you you might not think it's that serious that somebody else will step in, right? Um, and so just that lack of coordination locally on the state level has, I think, been a big impediment. Like. It's, it's tough. It's like a really tough field right now to be in doing census work, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and let me just give credit where credit's due, but for the work of like Texas Counts, the statewide group, Absolutely. who are also forming in a vacuum really fast, but for Naleo, who when I first, like that's why I joke around that Genesis is the veteran, even though she started <laughs> just a few months before me, I was calling her saying, what am I doing? Well, how does this work? What, when, you know, what are the strategies? And Lila coming in early on, you know, she called me. I think week one saying, let me catch you up, John boy. You know, <laughs> like, there's been a lot going on. Um, so I think we've, we've been really you know, lucky to have had these kind of groups step up in the absence of the state. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, you know, you mentioned the citizenship question earlier. Um, you know, in some ways, the upcoming count was sort of derailed before it even started with this sort of drawn out court battle as the Trump administration pushed to include a question about the citizen about citizenship on the questionnaire, you know we heard from previous census directors who warned against this um, about how it could depress responses, particularly among Hispanics and immigrants. I remember talking to one local official just as this was sort of being rolled out, who was saying, you know, the damage has already been done, no matter how this plays out, because this is out there now. Uh, you know, obviously that sort of came at the same time that the state was asking people on the voter rolls to prove their citizenship so that they could stay on there. It ended up overlapping. You know, I'm, I'm curious about how much of that fallout are y'all dealing with now? Was the damage actually done even by the debate? And are we underestimating how it might actually affect responses from people? So the Bureau itself like did testing on this, right? They, they saw that if they put it, if they put a citizenship question on the form that about approximately 6.5 million people would not respond. That's pretty significant. We know anecdotally, right, if you talk to community members and you ask them about citizenship, they're not gonna answer. 
And one of the biggest questions that I would get when I was doing, when I was in the field was, is, is there any question about citizenship? Do I have to be a citizen in order to participate? So yeah, I think the damage is done because the, la the other thing that, as you mentioned, it derailed planning. People kept holding the line. They kept saying like, well, let's, let's wait and see how it pans out. But what we should have been doing is like going full, full steam ahead um, in terms of our planning with or without the question because we have to complete the census, right? We have to get an accurate count. So we needed to come up with the plan and I think people just held the line a little too long. Um, in addition, I think that, um, so yeah, I'll say that, yeah, the damage is done, but I think it's, it feels very pointed, right? It feels very pointed at the Latino community and immigrant communities too. And so I think that maybe the positive side of this is that I stepped into this role right at the height of this uh, legal battle. And one of the things that we saw was that we had advocates on all immigration fronts. So we had the um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice. We had the Arab American Institute. Um, uh, Baji, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, all of these advocates came to the, the table as well and said, this is not just a Latino issue, this is everybody's issue, and this is how we need to advocate against it. And so I think that has made um, census outreach a little easier in that sense, because we know it's not just like, we're not just focusing on, com on one community, we're actually tr trying to be in this together. So I would say that that's kind of a positive that came out of it. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Are you running into it as you're knocking on doors and or designing outreach events? Well, and to be clear, our canvassing operation has, has not begun yet, but a absolutely. I mean, I mean, 110 percent. One ex example that came to mind was actually earlier this week, I had a meeting with leadership from our Asian American Complete Count Committee. So Complete Count Committee, CCCs, it's, I joke, it's an acronym. I, I never want to see those three letters around each other again. You know, because uh, that's the Census Bureau's organizing model. They ship out to communities and they say, oh, you want to do the census? Start a CCC. And so one thing we did here in Travis County is uh, we were lucky enough to have an Asian American community that stepped up and said, well, we're going to get organized ourselves. They created their own Asian American CCC. Since then, we've built off of that and we have several other ones going. But specifically to this question, uh, you know, some of the folks who were in the leadership of that Asian American CCC were involved. 10 years ago during the last census effort here in Travis County. And they said there was never an issue with that, tr you know, n nowhere near that level of trust. You know, there's, you know, one of the folks was talking about, he, he has been trying to communicate with folks at supermarkets and folks from foreign countries would just go, absolutely not. You can't convince me, I'm not doing it. No way they're getting my information. And they just keep on walking. And he said that is a phenomenon unique, and this is anecdotal, but unique to this this census and so that's that's so unfortunate um I, I do agree there is a positive spin on here right i mean you know my i know that my role and maybe in part your role and y'all's whole campaign was in response to a lot of this stuff being drummed up um but i, I wish my role didn't have to exist right you know i wish there wasn't this 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 kind of unique moment right now happening where we have to have this campaign we're investing in and pushing in just to get folks to trust the government that their information is safe yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we don't, it, we're already in a situation where people don't, let alone not trust the government, but not trust cyber, not trust mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. uh, you're putting information online just in general, if you're applying for a credit card or buying something on, you know, on, online. So you have that. Uh, it just goes back to that it is so important for businesses, but it's also, we, we, we get as a Texas, as, as Texas, this, the census is, is created to count who is living here, period. So the question, it was just unfortunate that that, but we need to, we need to, we're moving forward now. We need to count who is, who is living here and, and, and go forward because as you've already alluded to, we, businesses use this information for where to, where to, where to grow, where, where they're gonna have employees, where, where they may wanna move, what schools, and just all the different, for the next 10 years, and we, we have this one shot, but under counts, are going to really affect, you know, low-income areas because the the amount of money that's not going to be coming back from the federal government that should be because those individuals are there and need it. So it's disproportionate as always. It's not, I'm telling you something you don't know, but it will be a disproportionate uh, negative uh, for low-income families if if we have an undercount. So that's why, just we don't just think of it as in terms of a, of as important for business. It is critically important, but it has it's just important for for the state of Texas and that we have the amount of money 
that, that if we have, and we were owed a, another member of Congress based on the population that we have that, that member of Congress, I think we're thinking there may be two or three new members of Congress coming out of this, if we only have two versus three, and in what areas, those individuals living in that area are, are, not, are gonna be underrepresented. So then, again, it's, 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 it's just, it goes to dis, disproportionate, but it's also just a, uh, something that we as a state, I don't care who you are, there's no target demographic, I was just having a conversation, there's no target demographic for this. It's, if, you're, if you're breathing, you're part of, you need to be part of the census. And so we have, it's just, yeah. <laughs> One of the things I, I just wanted to add is that I, I know that the Census Bureau is also really aware of this mm -hmm. damage that has been done, and they're working really hard to make sure that their media campaigns are really touching on that for the different groups that are really feeling some fear around um, this issue of their data confidentiality and um, the citizenship question. And so I know that they're working really hard on that. But also, they've released sort of the, the sample of what, that form, what the census uh, form is going to look like, and then like online guides of how the online form will look like. And so I think those are really helpful tools that can really show something very tangible to community members who are experiencing that fear that, you know, that question is absolutely not on the census form. And really, um, they also have a lot of materials that really highlight the confidentiality and security of, of those data. And of course, you know, the, the fear is out there, but one of the things that I really like to, you know, emphasize is that the data really, you know, stick with us for the next 10 years. And so, as you mentioned earlier in um, the conversation, a lot of the communities that are harder to count and that may be experiencing some of this fear are also the ones that are really going to benefit the most from a lot of these programs. And so it's really important. We know that it's a, it's a calculation that they have to make, right? And it's a, it's, a, it's a scary one. But we really hope that they are able to consider and connect how the decennial census will impact their quality of life while they are here. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, I think we can sort of all agree that this feels like the most politicized census in quite some time. Um, you know, I remember hearing from Census Bureau officials saying we would so benefit from having the governor go on TV and say, please participate, endorsing this at that level and then, you know, every level beneath that. Um, but, you know, John and Genesis, you all don't, probably don't spend that much time working with Republicans. Um, but I am curious, you know, Justin, if you see sort of a, a mediator role for the business community to play here in getting people who might not normally work with these folks to play a role in this. And I just want to be really clear. Uh, one of our county commissioners, Gerald Doherty, is a Republican, and he has been part of the unanimous support we've received on the county commissioner's court. Uh, and several Republican leaders here locally have been supportive of our efforts. So I just wanted to make that real clear. <laughs> Bastrop County judge was just on the radio this yeah, morning absolutely. talking about their <laughs> efforts. You'd be, were, yeah. you'd be surprised yeah. who's stepping up. Sorry. I think it, no, no. a lot of people recognize that it's not about party affiliation. And so if you're bringing resources, if you're bringing knowledge, like people are willing to engage with you at the table. Yeah. We live in a very hyper political time. And I understand that, but it, this is not, I mean, the, the council I work for is a non, is bipartisan, nonpartisan organization. Um, and this is just not one of those political issues, I, but I get that it, is, it has become, uh, you know, at the federal level, um, but that's why we're, that's why we're working against, uh, there's multiple reasons uh, why we're, what we're trying to do. And uh, all, all we can do is just, yeah, be the voice that says this is important and it's not, it's not about, uh, you know, what uh, political party you're with, it's not, uh, you know, what region or what side of town or any of that. It's, a, it's, it's a, I, I hope to be, I hope we're providing a voice for that. We're, we're certainly trying to get um, a large uh, company CEOs down to small uh, owners of companies to, to put the word out that this is important and, uh, and you know, maybe there is some trust issues with government. And there are, I mean, there always has been to some degree. And, and cyber, certain, you know, online for, for sure, but maybe people will trust, well, but my boss, or my, you know, maybe, <laughs> may or may not, but you know, my, my manager, this is important. And so the more voices, uh, certainly with the faith-based part of Texas Counts, you know, with, with pastors talking about it, and with uh, you know, chari charitable organizations and Goodwill and United Way talking about it, 
uh, you can you can get that. That it's not it's it's not just a uh, this is not a um, a Trump administration effort. This is the census. It's been going on for you know hundreds of years. It'll be going on for hundreds of years. You know, and it's it's not a it, but it the challenges are there. Yeah. Uh, we talk a lot about the funding that could be lost in an undercount, you know, the director of a Head Start program who, whose funding is based on the census but ends up with more families and children, you know, knocking at their doors looking for support. Uh, Lila, what's the impact on how we continue to assess our growth, the pressure on safety nets and services that come with that growth, grows for the next 10 years, you know, is the reality that we just have to live with an undercount baked into all of that data for 10 years? Yeah, that is the reality. And so, for instance, um, all of our data, our population projections, our population estimates that we produce for the states, eligib eligibility criteria that are determined right after the census uh, count, all of those use that decennial count. And, um, you know, if they are undercounted, in particular for, um, for programs that use that decennial as the base, there, there is no movement around it. And sometimes even when, a, when, they go, when geographies go through the appeal process, because they can appeal if they really feel that there, there was an undercount, um, they can even go through litigation, um, they can move some of those, but sometimes that base stays the same. And so the effect is there, and it's there for the rest of the decade. And so right now, another one of the statistics that we've been sharing a lot is that if Texas experiences a, just a 1% undercount, um, we would be losing $300 million per year for the next 10 years. Now that's a lot of funding, and right now, um, the projections aren't that Texas would be undercounted by 1%, but it's closer to about one and a half percent. And so the stakes are high. Yeah. How are y'all preparing for this? John, I'm curious at the community level, you know, how do you prepare to run a county for the next 10 years when you know that the count, the, a lot of the funding that you're writing your budget off of is going to be off? Well, thankfully, I won't be a part of running the county <laughs> in 10 years. So that's, <laughs> I'll leave that to folks who get to have that fun job. Um, but no, I mean, from, a, from, the, from the county perspective, from the city perspective, what, what I've heard our leadership say over and over again uh, is that, fun, that, that question of funding, the fact that they would not be getting the dollars they desperately need. You know, I, I'd probably assume that most of the folks in this room are residents of Austin or Travis County. You know, we all know that there's a great deal of infrastructure needs here locally. And, you know, folks have been going to the ballot boxes and supporting those, but my goodness, you know, if, if we're looking at tens of millions of dollars a year, that our region would be missing out on, that's a bond election we don't have to go after, right? Um, that's a tax raise we don't have to go after, right? Because at the end of the day, these things still have to get paid for, right? I mean, that's like, that's one of those great questions of our time, just because, you know, the funding's not there may not mean the need's not there. Um, and so that will be some harsh realities, I imagine. But, but going back real quick to this question of how we even determine how much funding's at risk, one of the first things uh, you know, we were trying to do when I got on the job, and I remember asking Dr. Valencia about this and others, was how much is really at stake? So when I go talk to city council member X or mayor of small town Y in you know, Western Travis County, you know, how much are they going to lose? That they want to hear that. And as we tried to figure that out, I remember you know, Cassie Davis over here, we were getting on the phone with CPPP. We were trying to figure out how, you know, how do we calculate this. There was a professor out on the East Coast, I think at George Washington University, and I called them, I left them a voice, and I said, man, you did all this really great research from a national lens on how much this stuff costs. Can you tell me how much from a Travis County resident's perspective it's gonna matter to them? And he called me back and he said, would you Texas people please stop calling me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he said, got us on this big email list. He said, I'm hearing from people in Dallas, Houston, El Paso, you know, like you're all trying to figure out this question. And that one, again, is another example of the state not being there providing that leadership and that, you know, guiding on those questions. But then two, that that's really one of our best pitches to the business community and others is that financial, that financial lens. And what he ultimately said to us, it is way too complicated. There are just far too many funding sources, right, that depend upon census data. There's just too many ways you can calculate how census data impacts folks. And then even when you're looking at these averages we use of $1,500, you know, as our county tax assessor, Bruce Elfont, I always like to say it's $1,500 a year per person we don't get undercounted. It's the best estimate we got. But when you talk about folks in Title I schools, right, that number goes up. When you talk about seniors with you know, assistance at home, 
that number goes up. So it's a huge fluctuation across the board that I think also, again, just speaks to how important the census is. We've had the largest, in I'm sorry. No, go for it. We've go had ahead. the largest increase in numbers as, in, as a state of any, of any of the 50 states over the last decade. Uh, Austin, and then Austin and North Texas are both, and other areas that certainly in the Valley too, McAllen area, have been growing just you know, much faster than, than average. Uh, and so uh, you already, you've been, and you've been seeing the challenges of funding, both at, you know, at the state level and the county level and city level, it's, it's been going on. And so just another, another point to make that uh, the, the, more, the more we know money can be sent back, a lot of it that we sent up that can be sent back, uh, the better for across the board, but you know, for any, any, at any level. I was just going to add to speak to John's point. I think uh, making that number relatable is also really hard. Like people have a lot of curiosity about like, well, how does that impact me? Because I participated in the last decennial and the road outside is still not fixed. And so you have to think about how do I talk to a person and say, well, like how many people here have student loans? Raise your hand. Raise. Okay. How many people have kids? Okay, how many people drive on highways? Okay. <laughs> how many maybe know someone or have been on Medicaid? Yeah, exactly. So like those are real programs that people touch every day that you can share with people. Like maybe you can't relate on that $300 million amount, but you can relate to having student loans and wanting Pell Grants um, and not having to fight for parking at UT. Like you, <laughs> there are things that you, you can tangibly share with people that maybe, you know, I think that's another challenge that we face, but we've had to come up with creative solutions to say, or like to have talking points for the community. And at the end of the day, you know, even though there's that dollar attached to it, really, you know, the fact that a more, a better educated, mm -hmm. a healthier Texas is, is what we need in order to keep this booming economy that the state of Texas has been experiencing going. Um, and so one of the things that I, I like to also talk about, especially when I'm talking to people that I know that um, have children or are invested in um, children's welfare, is that if a child who's about four years old um, is undercounted in the decennial census, really it impacts their future education pretty much through, you know, the whole, up to high school because all of their uh, elementary years, their middle school years, and some of high school are going to be impacted by this decennial count. And so it's really, really important that especially young children get counted this time around. Yeah. So uh, as acknowledging that outreach, and we're about to open to q and I'm sorry, I'm going over a tiny bit, but this will be the last question. Acknowledging that outreach in, say, the mostly brown and black neighborhood I live in in South Austin will be fairly different to the one in Terrytown. Um, what are the things that people who are sitting here, all of whom are gonna fill out their questionnaire, nod your head so they feel better, um, <laughs> what are things that they can actively do at their level to help with this? Because I think a lot of the times people hear the doom and gloom and it's so easy to shut it out, but what can people actually do at this point? So, so I'm, I'm happy to jump in here, um, and that's been, you know, like I mentioned at the very beginning of this, there's once folks realize how or why, why the census is so important, they then ask, how, they then ask, how can I help? Um, and one thing we're going to be rolling out the first week of February here locally is we've got a new website that's going to be launching with our neighborhood organizing map is what we're calling it, and that will have on there both locations that folks can go take the census once it's, you know, like libraries, foundation communities is saying they're tax free, you know, they're free tax centers. Uh, will be available but we're going to list those different locations but then what we're also going to try to do is say hey do you want to organize in your neighborhood do you want to go block walk in your do, you know are you part of a neighborhood association that would like someone to come out and talk about the census well type in your email address sign up in here so that's one immediate way that i would say that uh, is coming down the, the pipeline for folks here who live in austin travis county um, but then another way is uh one thing we tried to do after uh, i went down to houston and talked to some of the folks running their census team that had so much more time and money uh, was how they were kind of organizing internally. Something really cool they'd done is done a round table of members of these hard to count communities. Um, you know, God bless us here in Travis County in Austin, Texas, but you know, when you took a snapshot of our institutional leadership or a lot of the folks there at the table who were ready to hit the ground running, we didn't have a lot of folks from those hard to count communities in the room. And so one thing we've been doing is going out trying to create CCCs in our hardest count communities like the black African-American population, Hispanic, Latino, 
uh, Asian American uh, group had already formed. And then uh, the Austin Coalition of PTAs, who Jenison and I have spoken to, they're doing their own trainings, getting their own, their own efforts underway. So if you are a member of that community or you'd like to assist them, grab me afterwards because they have their own, they have their own Facebook pages, they have their own meetings they're running, they're developing their own messaging material. So if that's something you'd like to contribute to, that's something you can do right now because the materials they develop are the ones that we will use to walk your neighborhood, right? And it will look vastly different from the ones we use at North Lamar and Runberg because those are two totally different communities, right? Um, and so that's somewhere, that's a way someone could help right now. Yeah, I think the simplest thing you can do is fill out your form early, completely, and online, if you can. Um, that helps the Bureau a lot. I think one of the pieces I always like to share is that the Bureau is also underfunded, uh, which means that they're running up against a lot of uh, challenges with hiring, uh, just with infrastructure. And so one of the ways you can best support them is by actually just doing it online, so they don't have to print you a form. Uh, you can talk to people, tell your neighbors, tell your coworkers, your friends, put it on social media, share a lot of the collateral that we have. Um, you can visit our website, agasecontar.org. And you can also share our bilingual uh, census hotline, which is 1-877-EL-CENSO, um, which I think is pretty clever that we got that number. And uh, yeah, just like talk to people and promote the census jobs. So the I, I don't know what they're paying in Travis right $23 now. $23 an hour. Yeah, but in Houston, minimum. it keeps going up because they can't find people. And so tell that like high schooler, senior, who's just turned 18 to go and apply, college students, what have you. Um, it is kind of one of the best ways that we can help facilitate this process because what you want in the community is if you have to send out an enumerator, is that you want them to look like the community, talk like the community. You don't want someone parachuting into that, to that neighborhood, and so I, that would be very helpful as well. But fill out early, don't forget your kids, don't forget your non-family members, talk about it, and apply for the jobs. <laughs> and if you have any issues talking about it, if you're just like, well, I'm not quite sure what to say, reach out to us for resources. Mm -hmm. There are so many great resources. As uh, Justin mentioned on texascount.org, there's so many res uh, resources. Naleo has resources. Uh, Austin and Travis County CCC. Reach out to us, and we'll be happy to get you materials. Um, and the Census Bureau has lots of materials as well. And then uh, apply for a census job. It's, it's a great experience. I know a lot of people that join the, the Census Bureau and then stay on to do other work because they just love it so much. Just very quickly, I don't, and I don't, I just want, the only thing I wanted to add to that, I don't think anyone would have gotten the wrong, but the, the TexasCounts.org, the Texas Counts Committee is, and I mentioned this already, it's not just a business outreach. In fact, we're one of the smaller group. There's the education. We have a group of people focusing on government, state agencies, county governments, healthcare, a variety. So yeah, the resources there are, you will find a resource for you. There's infographics, you can download things you can do and just to share. All right, well, I ate up some of our question and answer time, but we've got a mic going around. We've got nine minutes. So uh, please make sure your questions end with a question mark so we can get through as many people as possible. We'll start back there. Hi, my name is Ginger Gossman, and I met one of the state agencies that was uh, at the meeting with the Secretary of State. Um, first, I want to say I'm really excited because my 21-year-old nephew just got the, got the call to be part of the census this year, so oh. I'm pretty excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, and the second thing, I, I was wondering, so we're, Texas is one of 24 states that didn't put any money on the table to collect census data. Are we talking to those other 20? three or 25 states to find out, how, and that's why I figured we are, that we're trading lessons on how to make this work even though there's no money on the table from us. Um, okay. Yeah, so basically we actually get on a, on a state sharing call every month. Um, actually, it's every two months, and I think they're moving it up to every month now since the census is right around the corner. 68 days away, folks, 68 days away. But really, you'll be receiving um, your form sooner, closer to uh, mid-March. But um, so we get on these calls in our region and we hear from the other states and we hear what they're doing. And so that's been really helpful, especially when we go to the state agency roundtable. We're able to share ideas about what other states are doing. We're able to share ideas about what other states who have a complete count committee but don't have funding because there, there's a lot, there's kind of a spectrum. And so we get to hear what they're doing as well. And we absolutely you know, share that information 
with our partners, with the state agencies, so that everybody kind of has ideas and inspirations around what can be done. And then the only thing I would add to that is there is a National Conference of Mayors, I think is the group that's called, and our mayor's a part of it, and there's a, uh, there's a group of folks that are going around talking to each other, and that was where I learned, for example, the lesson that even once we got folks around the table five months ago, we were still trying to figure out what exactly we were gonna try and do. And so that was really helpful to at least be validated hearing from other cities in similar situations that they were going, yeah, we don't know either. You know, and do you have any ideas? Here's what we figured out. Anyone else? Go down here to the middle. Oh. oh. Hey, I'm Cassie. Um, so I know you mentioned uh, kids are undercounted, young kids specifically. Can you talk a little bit more about why young kids are undercounted and um, how we get out the count with them? I can take this one and listen. So it's like a host of reasons. And um, thank you for asking that, because this is like, like there's so much overlap, right, between the young ch children and so many of the other hard to count populations. But it can, it's a host of reasons, but mostly it revolves around their living situations. If they're, if they're living in more complex sort of living situations, for instance, if they live in two separate homes because of, of divorce, or if they live with someone um, other than a relative, uh, if they're foster children, if they're in larger households where there's multiple families living within one household, there's, it just becomes much more complicated to, to count and to remember to count that child as part of that household. Uh, and what we just try to remind everybody is that you need to count everyone, even if it's that little infant that was born, um, you know, April 1st, that little infant should be counted as well. And um, they're just, it's really just so important, um, and especially for the Latino community. The Latino community is almost, um, the young uh, children uh, who are Latino in Texas are almost twice as likely to be undercounted compared to non uh, Hispanic white children, and so it's uh, one of the fastest growing populations in our in our state. It's definitely adding the largest numbers, and so we just need to make sure to get that population counted. That's definitely the definitive answer. That's the best answer. But there's still also a little bit of that, you know. Oh, I, I've heard I heard it before. In fact, today, but uh, for I remember this from past since this is like oh my 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 child needs to be counted. Yeah, I, I think there may some people just interpretation of it as. You know, it's the two working adults, or one working mm -hmm. adult, or you know, my, my grandparents live with us. Yes, probably, but not not the. You know, it's just. Yeah. Hopefully, that's online and it'll be taken care of with the with the question. But, uh, but that's the main, obviously the main reason was what. Yeah, yeah, and I'll add to that. People f return the form, but they forget their kids. So mm -hmm. parents do engage with the form. They say they see. Oh, okay, I'm supposed to include everybody, but maybe the newborn. They're not just they're not thinking about them as a full fledged person yet, so they just forget. <laughs> Imagine you're you're a young mom or you just had your baby, like you're also a little scatterbrain. You don't think about maybe including that baby, but because so much of that funding relies on that age group, it's really essential that you count that 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 young child. And when you look at that census form, um, you may get a little bit frustrated because some of the questions seem duplicative and you're like, I already answered this, but they're doing it exactly for that reason. They're like, are you sure you've included everybody? Are there any young kids in your household? And it's just to reiterate and to remind somebody who may have forgotten that their child is a, a member of that household to include that child on the form. Yeah. All right, we've got time for one more. The lady back here had her hand up before you, I'm sorry. Uh, down here in the middle. Hi, um, to touch a little bit on the undercount for small children, so, and you were talking about living in um, some difficult situations. So in a circumstance, I'm wondering if y'all can give us some advice on how to address an issue such as this. So in circumstances where there might be more people living in a house or wherever that a landlord is aware of. And so people have trepidation in answering those questions honestly, and although by law, the Census Bureau is, you know, the information is confidential and will be shared. How do you assuage those fears um, when we're talking to people? I mean, I'll go ahead and answer this, but for me, one of the, I think, so I will share that I think sometimes fear is just misunderstanding, right? So if you just explain like no, or even if you acknowledge, like in a lot of my presentations, I, I actually point to this quite often because Someone has that question, but they don't, they're embarrassed to an, an ask it, right? They're embarrassed to say, well, I'm the person who has too many people in my home per my lease agreement. 
how do I count my family? So I think part of it is just telling them like, hey, don't worry, we won't talk, like the Bureau cannot talk to your landlord, they can't share your lease agreement, just be sure to include everybody on that form. And I think, again, the form itself will, will share, it does share like, please don't forget to include everybody, no matter what kind of living situation this is. And it does, the form itself also has the option of you explaining who that person is in relation to person one. So you can explain that this is a non-relative uh, non uh, person living in your household. This could be a nephew, niece, grandson, grandchild. Um, this could be a same-sex partner. All of these different identities can be allocated on the form, and so people have an, an opportunity to try to explain a little bit about their living circumstances. And, and one of the populations that always kind of surprises folks that's one of our hardest to count here in Austin Travis County is actually our higher education community, mm -hmm. so students. Um, and one of those reasons why is, for example, in the city of Austin, for some reason, it's, it's illegal for you to have more than three unrelated roommates in a, in a unit. Well, guilty as charged, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of folks who have affordability issues move in with a lot of different folks. And if, you know, that's, that's a fear or concern if, if they think it's gonna come at them on their lease. And, but what we're, we're fortunate about is our local apartment association has stepped forward and actually mm -hmm. said, hey, would you be willing to come to give us a training to property managers and apartment, associ you know, apartment association members on this exact fact? That, hey, can you try to communicate to your tenants that no, y'all won't see the census? Right, and that's kind of part of our pitch to them is it, it's important for you to not be worried about catching them, right? But instead, just to get the census done. So we're, we're fortunate locally; we have an association willing to take that on. And can I just add, the Census Bureau is really aware of sort of the the era of inf the type of information we're in right now, and they uh, are recognizing that. If you know of any misinformation that's, or disinformation that's going around about the decennial census, um, that you can go to their website and you can say, I keep hearing this or I keep seeing this. Can you verify this? Or can, I, I think you should be aware of it. And they're encouraging people. And so that's another way that you can really help with the, census, with the decennial count is by just making the Census Bureau aware of any sort of issues that you're hearing about in your community that are coming up as questions. All right, well, we are out of time, but let's give our panelists a round of applause. Yes, thank you very much to our panel. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Future Forum membership, if you want to uh, get more involved with the Future Forum, uh, come to uh, support more events like this, come to some of our member-only events. Uh, we have information about signing up for the Future Forum in the back. Uh, $75 a year, it's tax deductible, uh, $25 for a year for graduate students, and you, we can do uh, joint memberships for two people for $125. So uh, encourage you all very much, if you're not already members, to become members today, and if you are, thank you. And uh, thanks again for being here. Mm -hmm.